Buenos dias, campesarios. <laughs> Unfortunately, that is the last Spanish that you'll hear out of me directly. So I apologize for that. But today we're here to talk about free software and the creation of jobs. Now, I've been coming to Latin America for about 10 years, very, visiting various countries in Latin America. And one of the things that most people in the United States do not realize is that most of the people in Latin America live in a very dense environment. For anywhere between 80 to 83 percent of the people live in a city environment. And so if you take a look at cities like Sao Paulo, Brazil, or Mexico City, there's a lot of very tall skyscrapers that have a lot of apartments in them. They had a lot of small businesses in them. And it is very, very dense. Now, a friend of mine is a man by the name of Nicholas Negroponte. And he started a project called One Laptop Per Child because he realized that the way to bring education and prosperity to, pe to young people is to bring them the internet. And Nicholas cared in particular about young people in Africa. But in Africa, often the internet is 500 miles away from the child. However, in places like Sao Paulo and Mexico City, a lot of times the internet is not 500 miles away, it's only 50 feet away. And if you can bridge that last 50 feet and bring the internet to people, then you can bring them inexpensive education, you can bring them information that they need to live their jobs, you can allow them to communicate. I don't have to tell this room about that. So while Nicholas cared very much about the millions of children in Africa, I care even more about the millions of children in Brazil, in Mexico, in Argentina, and other Latin American cities. This is you. You are basically a good person, but you're a bit of a geek. OK, you're really geeky. <laughs> you're very technical. And what you like to do is set up your own business. But a lot of times, you don't know very much about doing that. You know, you know all about the bits and bytes and things like that. You know about the graphics. But you don't understand about things like marketing, cash flow, getting a loan from a bank, all those types of things. But you would like to have a job that works with free software. And perhaps would pay you $2,000 a month to start. And if you, as you went on, it might go up to $4,000 a month. And this is only a base salary, because this job would only take you about 10 hours a week. And during the rest of the time, you could actually do other things, like programming, web design, selling other things to people to make more money. And all of this would be where you would be your own boss. You would set your own hours, you would work, and the more you worked and the harder you worked, the more money you would make. If you would like to be able to do this and typically work from your own home, please raise your hand. That's what I thought, because I want you. <laughs> I want you to be a Project Cower entrepreneur. We were going to teach you about how to set up the business. We are actually going to let you be the local community leader of free culture. We are going to allow you to own your own business, manage your own time, and create your own future. But you can still be a geek. All you have to do is put on a tie. So here are the goals of Project Kawa. I want to create between one to two million new high-tech jobs in Brazil alone, 
and another million or two million high-tech jobs to the rest of Latin America, and perhaps in Central America and other places. But I know that this is going to work in Latin America because the numbers show that it will work. We also want to make computers easier to use. Computers are basically still hard to use. Even Mr. Jobs' computers are hard to use. You still have to worry about spam. You still have to worry about viruses, things like that. We're going to fix that problem, and I'll show you how. We want to be able to create more environmentally friendly computing. We want to be able to make computers last longer and use less electricity. We also want to be able to decrease cellular contention in high density areas. Now, in New York City, you can no longer make a telephone call using 3G. The reason for that is because so many people are downloading porn, uh, uh, I mean data, <laughs> onto their phones. And so when you go to make a telephone call, the bandwidth is completely used up. We have a way to fix that problem. I will show you. We also want to create a completely gratis Wi-Fi bubble over large urban areas. Not only free as in freedom, but free as in beer. We can do this. It's been done before. We want to systematize it. And we want it so that when you flip open your Wi-Fi device, you instantly connect to the internet. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to sign an agreement. It just happens. This is the way that God intended the internet to work. <laughs> and finally, we want to create low cost or gratis supercomputing. Supercomputing is very useful for companies in designing new products, in university students, in doing research, but they cost a lot of money. We figured out how to do this virtually for free. And here's the most amazing one. We're going to do all of this without any government funding. Because nothing against the government, but governments come and governments go. And funding, changes issue, or funding issues change. So we want to do this in the private sector to make it a sustainable business. Let's treat the first one. We're going to create millions of new jobs. We're going to create and allow entrepreneurs to put server systems in the basements of those tall office buildings, those tall apartment houses. And we're going to use thin clients to give computing to all of the people in those apartment houses and in those tall office buildings. The entrepreneur will be the systems administrator of that. They will take care of the systems. They will make sure they have enough computing power to meet the needs of their clients. They will also get rid of things like viruses and spam. Now, you may know how to do that already because that's technical. But what we're going to do for you is provide the business plans and the marketing materials and everything else that you need to go out and sell this type of service to the people in these buildings. And then once these people have agreed to buy this from you, you'll be able to go to a bank get a loan, buy the materials, and actually go into business yourself. We will also provide training and certification to you if you're missing some of your skills. So by the time that you are certified as a Project Cower entrepreneur, you will be able to go to the bank and convince them to loan you the money. You, as the entrepreneur, will go out and find customers for yourself. And once you have their agreement to buy this from you, you will go to the bank and borrow the money. We will provide training, both technical and business, to you at no cost. You heard me, no cost. We're going to put all of the training materials on the internet. You'll be able to pull them down for free, both technical and business. And, it, and for those people that do not learn very well using that type of training, we will have classroom training for you. You'll have to pay for somebody's time to do that, but that's a small price to pay 
for the job that will last you a lifetime. We also are starting an apprenticeship program. This is a program where you can actually earn money while you're learning. You'll be able to go to an existing Kawa entrepreneur, help them out with their job. They will pay you a little bit of money while you learn the business from them. Then you'll become certified, get your license from the government, and become your own entrepreneur. Now, as I said before, we're going to be putting these server systems in the basement of these tall buildings. We want them to be a highly available server so that they will never be out of work. We're going to have uninterruptible power supplies for them, as well as a generator in case the electricity goes off in the city, the generator will keep these working. The thin clients will be hardwired, connected to the server by one to 10 gigabit per second networking and use power over ethernet to supply the power to the thin client. So the thin client will never be without electricity. That's important because the thin client will be left on all the time. I'll talk more about that later. And finally, even though we're anticipating using mostly free software to do this, we realize that some people want to have Windows, some people want to have Apple OS X. Why, I don't know. But we can supply them with services in the, for those operating systems too. The bad news for them is because this is a licensed service they're actually going to have to pay for their software licenses. Now, the system administrator entrepreneur's job duties are basically to maintain the server software. The thin client will have no software on it at all. And therefore, all of the work will actually be done on the server. You will monitor the server to make sure that it has enough CPU power, and enough disk space to meet your customers' needs. You'll eliminate viruses, you'll eliminate spam, you'll do backups for people. These are things that people who use desktop computers typically do not know how to do. You can also teach classes to your end users. You may charge them a small amount of money for this class that you're teaching but it will help them use their computer better. Now, I have been in the computer industry for 40 years. And when I started, people who worked with computers had a master's degree or a PhD in computer science. A couple of years later, if you needed to get help, you were told to go to the help desk down in the basement of the computer system. Later on, you were told that you would get your help from the people that made the software. And slowly but surely, the help that you needed kept being moved further and further away from you. Now, if you need help, you call up India, or worse yet, West Texas, and neither one of those people can you understand. This is a problem. We need to move the help for end users closer. We need to make it so that somebody that's having a problem with a computer can get help in just a few minutes. And you will be the people that will help them use their computer system better. And finally, you will negotiate and sell to your end user customers additional functionality that helps them do what they want to do. So if somebody comes to you and says, I need a website developed or I need a little program written for my company, you could help them do that, either directly by yourself or help them find somebody that would do it for them. Now, in the computer industry, there's two types of markets we talk about. Horizontal markets, which are the markets for operating systems, compilers, libraries, and general programs like databases. And then vertical markets, which are markets oriented towards healthcare, retail, manufacturing, and so forth. We have, in Project Kawa, identified a couple of vertical markets, small to medium business. 
The average small to medium business in the United States is one to 500 people. But with those businesses, they generate 86% of the wealth of the United States. Small business is what actually drives the economy of a country. And in Latin America, the size of small, a small business is one to 30 people. The size of medium business is 30 to 300 people. Now, the small business typically does not have a systems administrator. What they do is they try and train a secretary to take care of the computers. Or worse yet, they try and change, uh, train a manager to do it. And believe me, the manager is much worse than the secretary. <laughs> so the systems administrator of the entrepreneur can help them keep their systems running. And therefore, it actually saves the company time and money. Apartments and condominiums. This is another vertical market. And I'll talk a little bit more about them in a moment. Hospitality, small hotels, small restaurants, they would like to have the same facilities as large ones. And finally, point of sale terminals. These are the cash registers that you see in a lot of different stores that are, they can keep track of inventory and do other things for the company. But they're very expensive, typically very proprietary. Let's take a look at apartments and condominiums. Not only can we provide them access to the internet and computing capability, but we can also bring them over-the-air digital TV. We can also bring them IP TV over the internet. We can bring them IP radio so they can listen to radio stations from around the world. We can bring them voice over IP so they can make inexpensive telephone calls. We can control the lights and the heat inside of their house. We can give them a security system. We can store their music and their calendar and their alarm clock. In other words, this thin client can actually replace a lot of the different units that people are using inside their house today and give them better services at less money. In the hospitality area, these small hotels would like to be able to have a nice reservation system. They'd be able to have a nice system that could allocate the proper room for the proper guest. Do you need two twin beds or one king size bed? What types of features do you want to have in your room? They can have a system for keeping track of their customer base to offer them specials throughout the year. These are the types of things that large hotels have, but small hotels do not. We can give them very good in-room facilities. In my hotel that I'm staying in Mexico, I have a TV, I have a telephone, I have a radio, I have an alarm clock. I could do all of this right through one thin client and give them a lot more. There was a study in the United States that said 70% of the in-room money made, in other words, money generated from inside the person's hotel room, was actually through watching X-rated movies. Yes, we can do that too. <laughs> now, another thing about Project Kawa is to try and make computing environmentally friendly. This is the Itupu power plant in Brazil. It's the largest hydroelectric power plant in the world. It generates 14,000 watts of electricity every hour. I'm sorry, 14 million. Oh, no, let's see. Try 14 billion, 14 gigawatts, sorry. 14 gigawatts. Now, the average desktop computer uses between 250 watts and 350 watts of electricity. My notebook uses 135 watts of electricity. That's because it's kind of special. <laughs> now, 
At 200 watts of electricity, this means that Itupu can actually power 70 million desktop computers. The problem is there's 192 million people in Brazil. So 122 million people still need to have electricity for their computers. This is even more of a problem because computers like yours, some of these tall desktops out here used by gamers, they may draw 700 or 1,000 watts of electricity. There is a rule that says that for every watt of electricity that you use to power your computer, you need two watts of electricity to run the air conditioner that's going to cool it. And in a country like Brazil and in a country like Mexico, you're very close to the equator. You use a lot of air conditioning. So here you have your computer, which is basically a large electric heater, and here you have your air conditioner trying to cool the room. If you reduce the amount of power that the desktop computer uses, you reduce the amount of power that you have to use for your air conditioner. So here is the solution, a 10 watt thin client. Now there have been a lot of thin clients in the past that are only used as a display device. This is the wrong thing to do. This thin client is a completely capable computer system. It is 64-bit, it does virtualization, it can run a complete operating system inside, in fact, multiple virtual environments. And it can do 3D graphics. So this is a computer that draws less than 10 watts, so you can afford to leave it on all the time. You know, a lot of people turn off their computers for two reasons. Number one, they try and save electricity. And number two, it's very noisy. You've got a fan in it, or multiple fans. This one has no fan. It has no disk. It's completely solid state. It does not even have a battery for the time of year clock. You don't need it. You get your time from the internet. So there's nothing in this computer to actually wear out and it has a lifetime of over 10 years. You always leave the computer on. When you turn off your computer, it is worse than a boat anchor. I mean, I own, I own a boat, I know this to be true. I throw over my boat anchor, it holds my boat in place. I throw over my computer and the boat keeps getting dragged along, okay? So there's a proof that a turned off computer is less useful than a boat anchor. But this you leave on all the time because when you leave it on all the time, it's your telephone, it's your alarm clock, it's your calendar, it's your security system. That's why the computer has to be left on all the time. And of course, it is connected to the server in the basement by hardwired ethernet. It also has USB 3.0 five gigabits a second. And with three, USB 3.0 and 802.11n, you can have a connectivity to the internet for your wireless devices of 300 megabits a second. Not one to two megabits a second, 300 megabits a second. Actually, there's a new inter, uh, Wi-Fi coming out. It's called 60 gigahertz. That would give you five gigabits per second between the thin client and your wireless device. We're also going to build into it a cellular modem. Now, I have been using GSM since cell phones first came out. In the United States, we normally use CDMA. But this means that I can get a good cell phone coverage any place in the world except my house. Now, recently, I installed what is called a femtocell. It's a little transmitter that goes, that sits there, captures my cell phone signal, and directs it into the internet and into the telephone system. So now, I have excellent cellular telephone coverage any place in my house, 
and I do not compete with any other cellular telephone user in my area for bandwidth. I can download porn to my phone as fast as I want it. <laughs> now, a lot of these motherboards are, are designed and manufactured in places like Taiwan and China. Pardon me for saying so, I think this is wrong. I think we should be designing and, and building these systems in the countries that they're used. I think that Mexico should be designing and building and manufacturing these systems in your country. So what we're going to do to make this happen is we are going to design an open hardware design for the thin client. And any manufacturing company that wants to manufacture it can do that. They will not have to invest in the design or the certification of the thin client. And at worst, they will have to pay a small royalty per board to pay for the design work wherever it is done. Universities and hobbyists will be able to get, use the design absolutely for free because we anticipate that they will extend the design and make it better for everybody. It's going to have an open BIOS called Core Boot, which already works, and we're going to have open device drivers. There will not be a single device driver on this which will be closed. Now you say, we've been trying to do that for years with Linux systems. Why can you do it now? There is a word in the computer industry that is all powerful, and that word is volume. When you talk about volume, people go, okay. And if you go to somebody and say, oh, I have 1,000 units or 10,000 units, would you please open up your device driver for me? They just go, oh, go away, I don't care. But when you say I have 400 million units, and if you don't open up your device driver, I'll use somebody else's device, they listen to you. So we are going to do volume. Another thing of, about volume is in the networking. Today, if you want to have the internet brought to your house, you call up the telephone company or the cable company, and they bring you three megabits a second, 10 megabits a second, like that. We're not going to be talking to the telephone company with individual people. We're going to be bringing in huge amounts of connectivity to the server in the basement and allow the server to distribute that to all of the people in the building. And what will happen to the telephone company is that they're going to lower their cost of sales because they will no longer be selling to individual people. They're going to be lowering their cost of support because they will no longer be talking to somebody where they have to say, is your mouse plugged in? Have you rebooted your computer? Instead, they're going to be talking to the entrepreneur, the person who's been trained, licensed, and certified to know what they're doing. So they'll be able to start off the conversation with, well, are you using IPv4 or IPv6? Okay? So they'll be able to cut their costs of support dramatically. And I've been talking with the presidents of Telefonica, Latin America, Brazil, and today Mexico on this particular project, and they were all in favor of it. We are going to have each one of the thin clients hardwired to the server. What does that mean? It means if the server can deliver 10 gigabits per second to the thin client, then the thin client can act as a wireless mesh repeater and give out small amounts of internet to anybody, absolutely free. If you're getting 10 gigabits a second, what do you care that you're giving off one to two megabits a second to somebody that has a cell phone or Wi-Fi pad or something like that? And people say, well, why would people give away internet for free if they're paying for it? It's because when they leave their house or their business and they go out into the park or they go out into the uh, 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 restaurant they'll be able to get free Wi-Fi there. This particular project has worked in, in projects like FON, F-O-N, 
It's worked in Beijing. It's worked in England. In the FON model, we have two different ways you get internet. You either, if you give it away for free, you get it for free. We call that the leanest model. If you pay for it, if you have people pay for yours, then you have to pay for it. We call that the bill model. And, but in any case, you get internet wherever you go. Now, one of the reasons you have to sign that little thing that says, I signed this terms of agreement of using Wi-Fi, is because people are afraid that you're going to use their internet to break into things. We fix that problem. The internet is going to become a virtualized layer that anybody can use, but nobody will be able to see. And it'll be completely encrypted. So this means that the person who is simply passing on packets is not going to be held responsible for the person's use of the internet. This is like blaming the telephone company because somebody was plotting some type of scheme over telephone lines. It doesn't make sense. And all of the data will be encrypted on the system, and you will be able to determine where you run your program, whether it be on your thin client, on the local server, or out in the cloud at any given point of time. So how many thin clients and servers are we talking about? I've run the numbers for Brazil. There are 192 million people in Brazil, and 80% of them live in a city environment. So we're talking 154 million people. We anticipate that each person would affect own two thin clients, one at home and one at work, one at home and one at school. So if you add to that about 90, 000, or 92 million point of sale terminals, we're talking 400 million thin clients. We average about 300 thin clients per server, highly available server. That means we need 1.3 million highly available servers for a total of 2.6 million system boxes. This is why Project Kawa has to be completely open. There is no company on the face of the earth that could actually satisfy this request. So we're making this with completely open design so that anybody can manufacture it and completely open specifications so that people, whether it be Hewlett Packard, whether it be IBM, or in Brazil, Positivo, or in Mexico, your local manufacturers could actually supply this equipment. And of course, all of the software is free, and all of the software already exists. In order to meet my goals, I have to train over 10,000, or I have to certify, I'm sorry, 10,000 system administrator entrepreneurs every month in Brazil alone. Now, this is why the training has to be free. This is why the training has to be over the internet. Again. We have no way to train that many people except we make it completely open, except we make it completely free. And the only thing you'll have to do is to get certification, which we're centering on LPI certification, which is also delivered over the internet at a very low price. So there's really no reason why anybody could not train themselves to be able to get and do this job. After you get your certification, you would then be licensed by the government, and then you would go to an insurance company to get insurance. Why? Because you wouldn't be protected against you doing something by mistake and having one of your customers sue you, and your customers wouldn't be protected from you doing something that is immoral to them. So we would insist that you would get uh, insurance from your local insurance company. How much would this cost? We believe that we can generate the thin clients in the beginning at about 200 US dollars a piece. We also think that under the long-term manufacturer, we get that down to 100 US dollars for the thin client. 
We believe that you know, we can use either Atom or AMD processors. We've already generated some thin clients on either one of them, and they work perfectly fine. About two gigabytes of main memory in it, that's $20. USB 3.0 already exists. The only thing that is currently still in the future is the Wi-Fi 60 gigahertz. But we could do 802.11 fine. So in other words, all of the hardware actually exists at this point. There's nothing that stops us from going forward. And the servers are reusable and resellable. We would have three different size servers. I call them Baby Bear, Mama Bear, and Papa Bear. And if you start off with, say, a Mama Bear, middle-sized server, you'll be able to easily upgrade to a Papa Bear. You can do that one of two ways by simply adding on more memory or more components, or by selling your Mama Bear server to somebody who needs it, and then using that money to get you a Papa Bear server. Now, Baby Bear is special. You may have noticed that the thin client was 12 volts. Why 12 volts? 12 volts is a universal voltage. Car batteries use it. You even have air conditioners that could use it, you know. Your cabins can use it in the woods. Your boats use it. Your cars use it. So you can put together two thin clients and actually turn them into a server, a 12-volt server, that you can then power that server using uh, solar panels or a water wheel hooked up to a car alternator or a wind generator or a bicycle. And if one of your thin clients in the server breaks, you take another thin client and replace it while you get the thin client rep repaired. How much will this cost in cabling? I was talking with Telefonica one time and they said, we'd love to bring fiber to everybody's house so that everybody would be able to have 10 gigabits per second in their house. But it costs 1,500 US dollars to do that on the average. And nobody wants to pay that $1,500. I said, this is the problem. You're thinking about individual sales. I'm bringing you 300 customers at a time. So the $1,500 drops dramatically. And I'm doing this in a long-term investment because I believe that the internet should be like the, the electricity in your house, the plumbing in your house. You don't buy a house that doesn't have plumbing. You don't buy a house that doesn't have electricity. You should not be buying a house that doesn't have internet. <laughs> and you pay for it the same way you pay for your house over the long term. So $1,500, I'm sorry, I can't be excited. And that's when Telefonica started talking to me. <laughs> we want to have high quality electric comp uh, components, hardware components, because the hardware is the cheapest part of this. What really is expensive is the services that you buy. That is the expensive part. So if you give good quality hardware, then the hardware lasts a long time. And you don't have to keep buying the service of somebody coming in and repairing your hardware all the time. That's our goal. How is this paid for? I said in the beginning, we take no government money. What happens is the systems administrator entrepreneur goes to a bank with their business plan, with the, all of their information they got from their customers. The bank looks this over. The bank, in the meantime, is familiar with Project Kawa. It knows what Project Kawa is about. And it says, OK, you seem to have everything in order. Here's the money to buy the equipment, to install it, and to start up your business. Now, a lot of people in Brazil say, mad dog, banks don't do that. They're too afraid that they are going to lose their money. I said, I can fix that problem. Because there's a thing in the banking industry called underwriting. When you take out a loan, 
There's an underwriting program. And every single loan that is given, a little bit of money goes into a fund so that if any bank loses its money on an individual loan, they can get that money out of the underwriting program. So you've instantly removed all risk of the banks to make the loan. There's no reason for them not to make the loan. And as the loans are paid back, the banks recycle that money into new loans for new entrepreneurs. And so the money is cycled over and over again. And because the manufacturing is done in Mexico, and these jobs are in Mexico, it means the money stays in Mexico and doesn't go to the small company, small country of Redmond, Washington. So how much money would you make? We've computed it to be about 1,800 US dollars per month to start. That's given 300 thin clients, and of the monthly payment that the people make per thin client, six, the $6 of that goes to you. The other money that they pay per thin client goes to paying off the hardware, paying for the internet connection, and other services. And this is a small amount of money for somebody to pay for your services, because I have calculated that as a world economy, we are actually losing $7.5 billion every day because people cannot use computers the way they should be able to. Or putting that in another way, if you have 300 people working for you and everybody loses 15 minutes a day because their computer isn't working right, that means like nine people never came into work. They didn't call in sick. They didn't say, I'm on vacation. They just never showed up. And if you were a manager, you'd be absolutely crazy about that. But by allowing people to have good computer access, we can actually fix that problem. We can actually save them money. We can give them better computing for less money. So you become a real entrepreneur. Not only do you lease this hardware to your customers, but you think about other ways of making money based around their services. And you could be making a very, very good salary for yourself as being your own boss. So here's how you become a Kawa entrepreneur. You can go to our website. We're going to be publishing everything about Project Kawa on the website. You'll be able to follow along you'll be able to see how to be an entrepreneur. You don't have to ask anybody's permission to be an entrepreneur. You can, you can study, get certified and licensed by yourself. You could go to the bank, get the loan, go into business. We, also, we, we want to help you be successful because this will allow more entrepreneurs to get started. And the harder you work, the more money you will make. Now, I have been working on Project Kawa for five years. Five years ago, I started to have the ideas about this system. Two years ago, a friend of mine from Brazil called me and said, Mad Dog, I think this would actually work. And for the last two years, we've been working on the fine plans of Project Kawa. This July, we actually launched Project Kawa at the Fisley Conference in Brazil. Our plans originally were to get some funding which will allow us to pull together enough people to really get Project Kawa off the, off the ground fast. Why do we need the funding? Because there's documentation to create, there is training to create, there's licenses and lawyer fees that have to be done there's a lot of things that have to be done that the free software community is not very good at doing. But that's OK, because we will generate funding to get it done. However, and, and, and once we had done that, we were going to have a pilot of this, small pilot, to prove to people that this would work, to iron out all the 
things that went wrong. Maybe we forgot about some type of training. Maybe we left out some type of software. But to fix those problems and then publish everything on the website. Well, then the next year, we'd be able to open this up to a great many more people, offer more courses and things like that. However, last year was also the Brazilian elections. President Lula was at the end of his term, and all sorts of grant funds just stopped. Then Dilma was elected. She started up the programs again. And once again, we are on track. Now, during this time, some real benefits happened. I changed the model of how to produce the software. We were going to bring out our own distribution, something like Project Kawa distribution. And then one day I woke up and said, that's incredibly stupid. There's already enough distributions in the world. We don't have to use a distribution. And this actually cut the development time and effort in half. So that was good. The second thing that happened was that the hardware caught up with the vision. The processors that we need are readily available. USB 3.0 is out there now. And so there's nothing in the hardware space that we have to wait for. And we can start up immediately. And the software, of course, continues to evolve. So this is the new timeline. We've decided to sell a smaller package, which is a home media center. It's based on UM, uh, XBMC, which is a free software project. But we've added some things to it to make it really spectacular. And we demonstrated this at the Facely Conference in Brazil in July. We're going to recruit about 100 SAEs who are already certified with LPI. And we're going to allow them to sell and support these units as their own entrepreneurs. While they're doing that, this will prove part of the model. It'll prove the part of the model that I believe in, that you guys can be your own bosses, that you guys can be your own salespeople, that you can actually have your own business and set your own hours and make it a successful business. And believe it or not, that's the biggest selling point. That's the hardest thing of trying to get the government to go along with Project Kawa, because they don't believe it. And neither does industry. They don't believe that you could do that job. I do. And so we're going to prove it to them. And then, at the same time, we engage the community to produce the rest of the software needed for Project Kawa version 1.0. We want to be able to develop the complete home automation model first, because we believe that's a natural fit. And that will allow you to go out to people living in your apartment house or your community, people that know you, and say to them, how would you like to have this really great system that will automate your house and automate your life? And if they, you sign them up, and then you can go ahead and start selling this. It will also give us time to develop the training and develop the client-server model better, and also go on to develop version 2.0 of Project Kawa. We expect that by January the 1st of 2012, we will be selling version 1.0 of Project Kawa. Or I should say, you will be selling version 1.0 of Project Kawa. And as I said, you don't have to ask anybody's permission. We'll have a list of different hardware vendors on the website that can supply you with the hardware. You'll have your choice. We'll have a list of different vendors that will supply you with the hardware for the servers. You'll have your choice. If you find hardware that works, great. Go ahead. Use it. And the software you'll be able to pull down off the internet for free. I have a board of directors that is made up mostly of Brazilians. I have one person from Argentina who will be representing the Spanish-speaking part of Latin America for right now. And I have one other American, other than myself, who happens to be an international lawyer on telecommunications. And we need him to keep us legal. 
Dr. Marcelo Zufo is from the University of Sao Paulo, and he has agreed to help us design the ultimate thin client and license that out virtually for free. We have the beginnings of a technical board, people who are already in the Linux community, and we're going to be building that out as we find it necessary. Here's the project site, www.projectkawa.org. We're going to be, we're setting that up right now. We're setting up Git as the source code control system. We have a bug system in place. We have the, all of the specifications for Project Kawa out there. And finally, I'd like to read this one last quote. Do not undertake a project unless it is manifestly important and nearly impossible. In 1994, I saw Linux for the first time. And while everybody else was saying it was a hobbyist toy, it was for geeks and techs, I said, I think it could be a wild commercial success. And all the people that laughed at me are now working for Red Hat Software. <laughs> I have shown this project to many people and not a single person has said why it won't work. In fact, they said, oh my God, it scales really well. So keep in touch, watch Project Kawa, log on to the site, join the development effort. We'll need people who can do translation, help with documentation, help with training, review the electrical designs all over the place. This is a community project and it belongs to you. With that, I'll try and take any questions. If you want to ask a question. Preguntas? Preguntas, preguntas. Do? Hi, my name is Eduardo. Uh, what do you think uh, companies like Apple Computer would do about this new project? Because I think this, this is clearly going to overmatch their current technology. And do you care, do you care about it? Well, the question is, uh, what do you think that companies like Apple Computer will do? I think they'll try and compete. But on the other hand, what I'm actually doing is I'm bringing huge wireless bandwidth very inexpensively to everybody. And if you're using an iPhone, all you're going to get is better service. If you're using an iPad, all you're going to get is really kind of instantaneous connection to the internet. So they might actually embrace this. They might actually find out that they will get more business because of Project Kawa. Now, let me explain to you for a second why the, everybody say wireless, 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 why that is going to fail. Believe it or not, wireless bandwidth is limited. And one of the laws that I have in my life that I've developed over 40 years is that people will, will accept all of the bandwidth you give them and more. There is no such thing as enough bandwidth, ever. Years ago, I had a friend of mine that said, desktop CPUs are fast enough. I kind of laughed and said, I've been hearing that for the last 30 years. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> so what Project Kawa actually does is create millions of Pico cells, tiny, tiny little cells, you know, the, the, the reason the telephone companies cannot do this is because nobody wants an antenna on the top of their building. The antenna on the top of the building is very expensive to put there. It creates problems with the building itself. But I'm going to create millions of these tiny antennas. And then what we can do is reduce the amount of electricity, the amount of power it takes, so that the cells become very, very small, but with incredible bandwidth on a per device situation. So you'll be able to have incredible bandwidth. And not only that, but when you use your cell phone and you're talking to a Pico cell, it'd be able to reduce the amount of power it needs. It no longer has to talk to an antenna that's two miles away. It's talking to a Pico cell that's only a couple feet away. 
And so your battery will last a lot longer talking to the Pico cell than it will talking to your regular cellular antenna. When you walk out of your house, you may still be talking to a Pico cell, but it's the Pico cell of your neighbor's thin client, or it's the Pico cell of the point of sale terminal. Only when you're outside of the wireless bubble would have to turn up its power to talk to the antenna that's off two miles away. So there's a lot of advantages of this to every computer manufacturer. And they can compete in their own level. Next question. Hi, I am translating the uh, question of Claudia Hernandez. How do you see the Linux and open source uh, community in 20 more years? Well, if Project Cal is successful, I'll be generating about 2 million new free software specialty specialists in Brazil alone, and probably another 4 million in the rest of Latin America. Currently, if you go to SourceForge, there's about 2 million software developers that are registered. So I'm going to be tripling that amount. And I'm not even talking about the rest of the world where Project Kawa may or may not work. I've, uh, quite frankly, when I saw Linux for the first time in 1994, I created a presentation to my management that said that Linux is inevitable. And they said, what do you mean by that? I said, nothing's going to stop it. Nothing can stop it. And I haven't had a reason to think that that was wrong in the past 15 years. So I really believe that proprietary software is actually doomed. It's doomed because it can't meet the needs of all the people in the world. There's currently 1.5 billion desktop computers, but there's 7 billion people. That means that 5.5 billion people have not selected their operating system yet. These people typically do not talk the 50 major languages of the world. They do not do business the same way that Bill Gates does business. They do not do business the same way that Steve Jobs does business. These people need to change the software to meet the way, to meet the needs of the way they do business and not the other way around. That's part, that issue is part of why we're losing $7.5 billion every day when the other 5.5 billion people join we will be losing somewhere in the vicinity of $22 billion every day. That's ridiculous. That's almost enough to finance a small war in Iraq. <laughs> OK, what else? I've got uh, two questions from Twitter. Over here, John. OK. Uh, so the first question is, uh, John, when you said that the uh, that uh, you can earn 4,000 and other additional 4,000, you meant Mexican pesos or dollars? Dollars. Very cool. Okay, and um, the other one is, John, where can I get more info to join this project? Where do I sign up? www.project.org, uh, projectcower.org. All right, and uh, I'll be translating this next question. Hola, mi nombre es Luis Enrique. Quiero saber este, las siguientes dos o tres generaciones que ya estén este, familiarizadas con el internet y todo esto, ¿cómo va a cambiar este proyecto, el, este, el CAOA, la vida de la humanidad? ¿Cómo va a cambiar quizá la forma en que vivamos en las ciudades? Este, quizá podamos estar al otro lado del mundo trabajando, trabajando en, en un proyecto, ¿no? Okay, so um, Luis Enrique asked, uh, for the next few generations that will grow up knowing internet all their lives, how will uh, Project Kawa affect, uh, how would it affect the way that people live in cities and the way they interact, uh, both locally and around the world? Well, this is one of the reasons why I said that the entrepreneur is going to be the, legal, the, the local leader of the, cult, of the free culture. I don't want them just to be a technical person 
I want them to be a person involved with free culture and free art. So this is a person that typically lives in the apartment house. I want this person to have a personality. I want them to you know, get together with their customers and say, look, we're going to have a class, maybe even a class in dancing, you know, and get people together. So I don't want people just hiding behind their computer screens. That's not the idea of Project Kawa. The idea of Project Kawa is to be able to spread the internet every place so people are now free to go and do things what they want to. So yes, I mean, part, you know, this is not just a job of twiddling bits and making sure that records are safe. It's a job where you have 30 hours a week that you might be able to do other things, including introducing people to culture and each other. You know, I can see a community of Project Kawa entrepreneurs, and more than that, a community of Project Kawa users who want to be able to exchange information. So I don't want this to just be somebody hiding behind a terminal. Another thing about, another thing about Project Kawa is, I believe that this is a job that could be done by people that are typically hard to employ. So we're not going to limit Project Kawa to these people, but what we want to do is to make sure that people like single parents are included, that single parents could do this job with, you know, in their apartment while they're taking care of their kids. Also physically handicapped people could do this job. There's no reason why a person in a wheelchair or missing an arm or, or anything like that, or even a blind person could not do this job. If there were things that they needed, that they found it physically impossible to do, they could hire somebody to do that and then continue to maintain the rest of Project Kawa. Next question. Hola, John. Eh, mi nombre es Oscar. Eh, entiendo cómo el proyecto va a afectar, bueno, cómo está dirigido a estas personas que eh, no tienen esta, bueno, estos skills o estas habilidades para la computación, pero habrá, ¿dónde entramos estos clientes que tenemos, bueno, que nos gustan estos gabinetes grandes, estos equipos poderosos y que a lo mejor no queremos una... Eh, pues este cliente que, que a lo mejor no va a desplegar gráficos impresionantes o, o todas estas capacidades que tienen estas computadoras grandes, ¿no? So, Oscar was uh, saying that uh, he can understand how this system works to people that have, uh, are, are in situations of limited resources and might not have uh, the skill set developed so much, but where do people that enjoy more powerful machines and use more, uh, are accustomed to more powerful graphics fit into the scheme? Okay, just like we said that we can support Windows users and OSX systems on top of Project Kawa using Samba technology, we can also support the more powerful systems you know, hooked in. These people would, you know, if they were using free software, they would still be able to utilize the services of the entrepreneur in helping to maintain that. If they were using Windows or OSX, they would, you know, they either might be able to purchase those services from the entrepreneur at extra money, or they'd be able to, to maintain it themselves, but still utilize the services in things like spam filtering, and things like virus detection and scrubbing, and in things like doing backups and restores for them. They will also be able to utilize the high bandwidth access to the internet, just like any other Project Kawa, uh, entre, uh, Project Kawa end user. So those are, the, those are the things we offer to those people who want to have the more powerful systems. Now, at the same time, um, one of the reasons why you have more powerful systems is because you want to have 3D graphics and you want to have high computational power. I didn't talk very much about the servers, but every one of the servers is going to be using chips that have 148 cores to them. And so you can have multiple CPUs per server the servers will have large amounts of main memory. And we'll, the servers can turn off that memory and those cores as necessary and turn them back on depending on the load. So if you've written your game or you've written your application to utilize a client-server relationship, you actually might find out that you get much better performance by utilizing the server 
and just displaying on your thin client. I mentioned USB 3.0. There are actually video chips that have come in USB dongles. You plug the dongle into the USB port, and then you plug your uh, monitor into the USB dongle. When those are running with USB 3.0, I think you'll find pretty acceptable graphics performance. Next question. Um, uh, my name is Salvador. Uh, I, I want to ask you, uh, what conditions does a city have to meet in order to make this project work? Okay, the question is what types of, of conditions that a city would have to have to make this work? What we're looking for is high density housing, high density. Um, project Kawa really can't help rural areas like the farms and stuff like that. That has to be a different business plan. We're trying to help cities that are extremely high density. So, or a, a, a small town that is high density. You know, what we're really looking for is a place where you might have 300 thin clients close enough together that you can hook them together with wired ethernet or wired fiber optics. We're working with the Brazilian government right now to identify some towns where the Brazilian government is planning on bringing fiber optic to every house, and that fiber optic that they bring will be a gigabit per second. There, what we could do is have the servers co-located in a building and have the thin client in the house and, and just have the gigabit per second you know, fiber transmitting the data to the thin client from the co-located server in a building you know, in an individual house. So a lot of it depends on the existence of the high density building. But as I showed in the picture of Sao Paulo, or if you look outside here, there's lots of buildings. And they're all you know, tall apartment houses that would fit a Project Kawa model. Did I answer your question? OK. OK, we have tenemos tiempo para una última pregunta. We have time for one last question. Down here. Hello, my name is Miguel. Um, what do you consider is the first limitation to reach this project? And finally, uh, what does motivate you to continue with this project? What was the first question? I'm sorry. What's the first limitation to implementing this project, or the greatest limitation? Greatest limitation? Well, right now the greatest limitation is trying to get the governments to understand this and the various partners. So like somebody brought up, you know, would Apple fight this or would you know, some other company fight this because they feel that maybe their business is in jeopardy? I have spent my entire life working on what I call win-win-win situations where everybody wins. And I think I've done a lot of study of this and I think the computer manufacturers will win, the end user customer will win, and certainly the entrepreneurs will win. Trying to get the governments to understand and do things that are necessary. So in Brazil, it currently takes six to seven years to legitimately create a business. The bureaucracy is unbelievable. And what I would like to do is get the Brazilian government to streamline this just for Kawa, pro Kawa entrepreneurs. So it would only take one day so the Kawa entrepreneur would go to the government and say, I want to be a Kawa entrepreneur. And the government says, oh, we know exactly what that is. Stamp, stamp, 10 pesos, please. Done. That's what we need, OK? We need the government to license these people, because these people will be doing very critical work for you. And unlike Facebook, <laughs> If they break into your accounts or something like that, I probably shouldn't have said that, but if they break into your accounts, they should be held responsible. And there should be a very, very high penalty for doing something like that. There should be a high penalty on people trying to decrypt your data. And these are the things that the government needs to understand and put laws into place in the licensing of an entrepreneur. So that's, the, that's actually the biggest roadblock we have right now. Everything else is moving forward very smoothly. 
Well, unfortunately, we've uh, run out of time. Okay. But uh, John, as always, it's been a great pleasure and a great honor having you here. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to say that I'll be around all day tomorrow, sitting over there in the software lever area and uh, free culture area. If you would like to ask some questions of me, I'll be right over there.